John chapter 8. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now you can read in Deuteronomy chapter 22 that that actually was the law. And you've got man's wisdom at its best. They thought that they had Jesus trapped. They thought that they had him into a corner. And this they said in verse 6, tempting him so that they might have something to accuse him with. I mean, they, they really wanted no part of Jesus and they wanted to catch him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the, wrote on the ground as though he had heard them not. So they continued asking him. Once they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped, stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw nobody there but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. All right, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this. First of all, you should know that in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11, many old manuscripts do not contain this originally. Some people uh, believe that it was added later. And I don't have a problem with that. But I will say that, it, that John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus begins to talk about how he's the light of the world, does flow better with the end of John chapter 7, where they're talking about, look and see and check the scriptures. You know, there, there's no prophet that's supposed to be arising out of Galilee. And then naturally Jesus would say, well, let me tell you about, you know, who I am. Nevertheless, we have this to deal with, a woman caught in the very act of adultery. So, What's going on here? And I've heard this preached many times in many different ways. Jesus is writing. He stoops down with his finger and almost ignores them. And just kind of, it's almost like he didn't want to deal with this. Well, he didn't really want to deal with this right away because this wasn't what he was trying to do. He wasn't, he didn't have any civil authority necessarily to condemn this woman in a court of law. This is what they were using against him. Jesus was operating on God's authority. Jesus was bringing God's, re representing God's voice and, and demonstrating God's will for the people. That's what he was trying to do. And they came with this, this thing on the side here and he handled it with the wisdom of God as they were dealing with it with the wisdom of man. And there's just no competition. <laughs> Jesus is called the the Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. We continue to see over and over, people try to catch Jesus in a situation, or they try to argue him out of something, or they try to beat him in some type of battle, but they never win, and they never will win, and we never will win because he is who he is, and we just need to bow down our knee to the fact that he is who he is, the wisdom of God and the power of God. What is this deal about him writing on the ground with his finger? What is he, what is he doing there? What is he writing? Well, we honestly do not know. Now, there's a lot of people that have um, speculations and I'm not against speculations. You know, if we think about it, if we look at the scriptures, the finger, the finger, it says he wrote with his finger. You know, he could have just been messing around, you know, writing, playing tic-tac-toe. I don't, I don't know. But it does say that the law was originally written with the finger of God in Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 and Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 10, 
Moses received the Ten Commandments written with the finger of God. Coincidence? Maybe. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. But we can also know that there is something about the finger of God. I mean, in Exodus chapter 8, when Moses was doing his works in front of Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh had his own magicians, some of the works that Moses was doing, the, the, the magicians of Pharaoh were able to do similar things. But finally, Moses did some things by the power of God, and the Pharaoh's magicians said, you know what, we, can't, we have no explanation for these things. This is the finger of God. The finger of God. And Jesus said something really awesome in Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Jesus said, but I, if I with the finger of God cast out demons, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. <laughs> the finger of God. Think about that just for a second. Yeah, the hand of God, we, we talk about the hand of God being on somebody's life, but it doesn't take much. Just the finger of God and demons can be cast out. Just the finger of God and, and wonders and miracles can be done. I just thought that's a cool little side note. Here's Jesus riding on the ground with his finger, and they keep peppering him, saying, you know, what are you going to do about this guy, this, this woman who's caught in the very act of adultery? And he is genius. Again, this is the wisdom of God on display. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And naturally, none of them were sinless. He is the only sinless one that there ever was. The Bible says over in Romans chapter 8, verse 33 and 34, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Really what I'm trying to say and what the Bible is trying to say is if anybody had any right to judge that woman properly, it's God. It's Jesus. Rep Jesus is the only one that had any right. God is the only one that has any right to judge you when it comes to those spiritual matters there. And yet Jesus didn't condemn her. He says, I, the only one that is rightfully able, righteously able to judge you, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. When he says go and sin no more, he's acknowledging, yes, this is sin and I, don't, I am not behind this. I do not bless this. This is not something I'm behind you. In fact, sin will kill you. I've heard it said like this, sin will steal your lunch and pop the bag. Sin is something that absolutely in no way, shape, or form is okay. It's not something that God endorses. And when we read this, just because Jesus didn't condemn her, in no way, shape, or form should we go ahead and take this as a license to sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says, For brothers, you've been called unto liberty, unto freedom. Only do not use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. It's an amazing thing to be forgiven of sin, to be abundantly pardoned, as Isaiah says. And sometimes mankind can take that as a license to just go and do whatever we want to do. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So here's Jesus, the only one qualified to condemn her properly. And he doesn't condemn her. Now he doesn't, again, he doesn't endorse her sin, which we see clearly, but he doesn't condemn her. And I'll tell you, it is a wonderful truth. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And this is something that is the right of every believer to have their sins cleansed from them, to, to be able to have your sins washed away. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. This is something that will really help you in your, in your walk with God uh, as you continue to study and read the scriptures and get closer to God. My little children, these things we write unto you, this word is written to you, that you sin not. But if any man does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. God is your advocate. He is not your condemner. He is not condemning you, but he is giving you this word and, and encouraging you and giving you the victory and giving you freedom so that you don't have to live a life in bondage to sin. And that's the thing that can be embraced. Psalm chapter 119, verse 9 says, How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 11, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Boy, this is good stuff. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke, then spoke Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And I'll tell you, this verse we could talk about for hours. Jesus said, I am the light of of the world. And if you remember in John chapter 1 verse 9, Jesus is called the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. That light can come from only one place, Jesus the Christ. And this is a wonderful promise that we have. If we are really truly following after him, Jesus says very clearly in black and white and red and white, if you're following after me, you will not walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. If we're walking in darkness, we've really got to ask our question, are we following him? Are we obeying him? Are we, are we living hard after him? That is the question. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, you bear record of yourself. Your record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto, unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you cannot tell where I, where I come from and where I go. You judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It's also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. Now, this is, this is interesting because, first of all, when he says that I am one that bears witness of myself and the Father that sent me also bears witness of me, in verse 18, he's, he's talking about Mark chapter 1, verse 11, where the Father, they could hear the voice of the Father, and it spoke over him when he was being baptized and he came up from the water and the father said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. And, and hear him, listen to him. So the father is bearing witness that this is basically my voice. Listen to him. Another interesting thing about this, this passage here in John chapter 8 is Jesus seems to be saying, I am one that bears witness of myself and the father is another. That's, you know, he sent me and he bears witnesses, witness of me as well. Now, in the Jewish law, there needed to be two witnesses. Let every fact be established by two or three witnesses. And really right here, Jesus is making a distinction between he, himself, and the Father. We are two separate witnesses, two different will, witnesses, which basically fulfills the requirement of Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, which is where... Their refer, where he refers to as their law. So Jesus wasn't deceiving these Jews. He was really honoring the fact that there's a distinction between his father and himself. Yet, the Bible says there's only one God. How do we reconcile that? You know, and, and this will come up when I have discussions with Jehovah's Witnesses because they believe that Jesus is not God in the flesh. They believe that God is Jehovah alone. And so they will go to something like this and they will say, um, look, Jesus is a separate witness and the Father is a separate witness and they're two distinct people, two separate. And I agree. In fact, I think it's important that we should agree to that. And there are some people that teach oneness, that uh, this oneness is more than, oh, let me say it this way. Some people teach and believe that um, there's no distinction 
between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they believe and they teach that there's simply one God expressing himself in three different ways. Yet you have this distinction, this distinction here, okay? I guess what I'm trying to say is, and this is such a, such a rich, deep topic, both are true. He is God in the flesh, and he also is God. There is only one God, but this issue of the Trinity is a great mystery, and it's, but it's very well established in Scripture, and I just, I know I'm not doing it any, any justice right now, but my point is in John chapter 8, it's not one but two, but yet the Bible says there's one God. Yet Jesus says, I am basically God in the flesh. So how do we reconcile that? Well, we've, we've, got, to, we've, got, to, we've got to be very inconvenienced and just allow for the Trinity. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. These words, Jesus said in verse 19, they said unto him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. Then the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said unto them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. That's why I said unto you, you shall die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What is, what is Jesus trying to say here? Especially when he says, um, you are from beneath, I am from above. What's he trying to say there? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says in verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy, talking about Adam. The second man, talking about Jesus, is the Lord from heaven. Jesus is saying, he, I am the God man. I'm not from here. I'm from a, I'm a different place. And you're not willing to believe that. You're we're not willing to receive that. And you won't be able to get to where I'm going, to the Father, unless you believe that I am he. Remember he said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you don't believe me and receive me, you're going to die in your sins and you're going to end up falling short of where I'm trying to get you to, back to the Father. That's the only way that we can be reconciled to God. But also in verse 24, he said that you shall die in your sins to them, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And interestingly enough, the word he is not there in the original Greek. It says, for you do, if you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. And I'll tell you what, John does this quite a bit. He has many I am statements that Jesus says, and one very, very potent one at the end of this chapter, which we're about to get to. But this is none other than the difference. There's no difference between this and what the Jews knew to be God speaking to Moses and saying, I am. And these are very straightforward verses Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Then they said unto him, Who are you? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. That's what we see Jesus doing. And we see him doing it perfectly, to the T. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am, and I am He, or I am, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me, for the Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. And as He spoke these words, many believed on Him. All right, let's back up to verse... 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am He. 
What's he talking about there? He's talking about when you have crucified me, when you have lifted up me on a cross, then you're going to realize, then it's going to sink in, this man was the son of God. And that's exactly what we see recorded. It's important to know this phrase, when the son of man is lifted up. I will, we're going to see this better in John chapter 12, but this is not talking about being lifted up in worship. This is not talking about being lifted up in exaltation, which of course Jesus deserves all of that. But this is talking about Jesus being lifted up on a cross. When you kill me, that's when you're going to realize that uh, I'm he, because I'm going to rise again. And that's when you're going to realize it. He says, that the Father hasn't left him alone, but he always does those things that please him. And let me just tell you this. There is not a moment, there is not a time, there is not one single thing that Jesus does that doesn't please the Father. He says he always does those things that please him. He, there is not one moment where he doesn't 100% to the T specifically express God. And this brings me so much comfort this brings me so much peace because I know that Jesus is not doing these things on his own accord. He, is, he has come to represent the invisible God. He has come to put a face on God. And as we see in Colossians chapter 15, 1, verse 15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God. And we can take absolute solace and put 100% confidence in the fact that Jesus is expressing who the real creator is. That just brings me such peace. Then the, Jesus, then the Jews said to Jesus, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, let me just say something about this wonderful statement. It's A disciple is not somebody that hears something and jumps on it and gets excited and then goes their own way and lives life the way, the, continues to live life the way that they did. No, if you're you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you continue in his word, if you continue in his word, you have to continue believing, you have to continue following, you have to continue obeying. This is something that is really not taught in our churches today, but Jesus is not looking for converts. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for Jesus Christ lookalikes, lookalikes. Notice he said, if you continue in my word, not the Old Testament scriptures, but my word, my commands. He said, I, I give you a new command. These are the things we should be continuing in. And man, what, what, what liberty we can really have when we continue in his word. And also, you know, when people talk about one and done believing and once saved, always saved, there are many, many verses that continuing to believe is implied. Colossians 1, 22 is talking about how God is able to present you holy and unblameable and un unreprovable in his sight. But 23 says that if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. Very important, but it's it makes all the difference. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. What am I saying? I'm saying the same thing that Jesus is saying, that all those verses that talk about if you believe, and you, such as Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and Acts chapter 2, if you believe, then you'll be saved. All of those verses what is implied, it's not always there, but it's implied, is something that you should continue to do. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the word free there is really talking about being like free or, or bound, such as um, a prisoner or somebody who's set free. And the Jews answered and said unto him, We be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. Now how are you going to say we shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Or in other words, they're not free. 
and the servant of, of sin, and the servant does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides, the son abides forever. And if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if Abraham's, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Abraham didn't do this. So what's going on here? He says, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham because everybody knows a child tends to emulate his father. You tend to just act like your dad. And Jesus is saying, if, if really you had Abraham as your father, then you would be doing the works that Abraham did. Abraham was called the father of faith. He was called the friend of God. And it should be noted that in the New Testament, there is a verse that is requoted at least three times. And it says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Abraham was the father of our faith. And what was the Jews... What were the Jews doing? I can tell you, they weren't believing God. They were rejecting him. They were rejecting his son right up in their face. And Jesus was saying, if you were Abraham's children, you'd act like Abraham. But now you're not. You're trying to kill me. You know, somebody who's trying to tell you the truth. Abraham would never do this. You do the deeds of your father, Jesus said. And they said unto him in verse 41, we're not born of fornication. We have one father even God. And Jesus said something here that differentiates the three greatest religions of the world currently. The three greatest religions of the world currently are Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And many people will say, oh, well, it's all the God of Abraham. It's all, they're all faiths that, faiths that extend from Abraham. So there's really no differentiation. There's really no problem. Jesus said something here that shatters that. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did I come of myself, but he sent me. Listen, if I'm Jewish or if I am Islam, if I am a Muslim, if God truly is my father, I would love Jesus. And all of those other things that come along with those things. Because is the truth be told, Islam and Judaism reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Islam rejects Jesus as the Son of God. They honor him as a prophet, but they reject him as the Son of God. Judaism, being a Jewish person, as these guys were speaking here to Jesus, rejects Jesus as the Son of God. This is the acid test to who are the real people of God right here. Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to give him honor and, and glory? Are you willing to exalt him? Are you willing to worship him and give him praise? Are you willing to put him first? Are you willing, as it says in John chapter 5, to honor the son even as you honor the father? Are you willing to love him right here? If God were your father, you'd love him, Jesus said. You'd love me because I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither did I come of my own self, my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and did not abide in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these verses. They couldn't hear the word of God because they were rejecting Jesus Christ. They couldn't grasp it. They were operating on natural ground. Jesus was talking to them about spiritual things. And because of their pride, they were deceived. They couldn't, they couldn't do it. They couldn't hear it. They couldn't comprehend it. Pride is a very deceiving, blinding thing. It's a very evil thing. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. They couldn't hear his word because they were of their father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. What does that mean? They're, he's talking about when he's basically saying 
he deceived Adam and Eve, your parents, your, your first parents. He deceived them. He was the one from behind, behind that whole thing and didn't abide in the truth because there was no truth in him. And basically Jesus is saying, you are abiding in that deception right now because if you weren't, you would see who I am and you would embrace that. He says, and because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? What is he saying there? Let me just read it, read Barnes's response here to this verse here in 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? To convince with us means to satisfy a man's own mind of the truth of anything. But this is not what the meaning is here in verse, verse 49, 46. It's not convince, but it's convict. Which of you can prove that I am guilty of sin? It stands opposed to truth. The argument of the Savior is this. Listen very carefully. A doctrine might be rejected if it could be proved that he that delivered it was an imposter. But you cannot prove this of me, says Jesus. If you can't prove this of me, then I'm not an imposter and you're bound to receive my words because it's truth. And that's what Jesus is saying here when he says, if I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? You, you, can't, you can't convict me of sin. And I just love this verse, which one of you convicts me of sins? Which one of you has anything on me? There is a certain confidence that you can have this is for us now. When we are walking, now we've all sinned, of course, and fallen short of the glory of God, but we don't have to walk in it. And there is something very confident that we can have when we are walking with a clear conscience and we don't have any sin dominating in us in our lives because sin, truth be told, sin makes cowards of men. You know, but when we're, when we're operating on all four cylinders, when we're walking in the, in the leadership and guidance and joy and, fo and focusing on, on the purpose of the Lord in our lives, then there's really no sin. When we're walking according to the Spirit, we're not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5 says. And it says this in 1 John 3.20, For if our, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And I would add confidence in front of men, just like Jesus did in this situation. Listen, it is important and imperative for us not to be walking in, in a lifestyle dominated by sin. For the Bible says in Romans 6, 11, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you. This is the way to walk. And when we do, we can have the type of confidence and boldness that Jesus has as he speaks like he speaks. See, the righteous are as bold as a lion. When we understand our righteousness and we are, when we are walking in lives that are you know, clean lives, when we're living lives just with a clear conscience, void of, of the first thing that we wanna do when we've been sinning is say, well, don't ask me because I'm not worthy. I, who am I that I should you know, speak a word in due season to somebody's life when, I, when I'm walking this way. See, that, that's what it does. Sin makes cowards of men. But, but when, we, when we can walk with a clear conscience, we can talk just like Jesus does, does here. And we can have the confidence to say what he would have us to say. And this is something that, that you know, we've got to hold on. It's, it's easier said than done, I will admit. But this is something that we've got to hold on to. And in verse 47... Just after Jesus says that, he says, He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore do not hear them because you are not of God. And so that is a, he's still in the middle of this whole exchange with the Jews here. And the Jews answered and said unto him, Don't, aren't we correct in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a devil? Aren't we right in saying that you're crazy, that you're a Samaritan? Well, telling him, calling him a Samaritan here is basically bringing the idea that he is problematic, you know, that, that he's a heretic, that he's schismatic. Aren't we right in saying that you're just completely out of line and, and demon-possessed here? And Jesus answers and says, 
I don't have a devil, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I don't seek my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keeps my sayings, he shall never see death. Whoa, what a, what a statement. <laughs> then the Jews said unto him, now we know that you're demon possessed. Now we know that you're crazy. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you sit here and say, if a man keeps my sayings, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets, which are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? This was a huge statement that Jesus was making. And of course, we know Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, though, though you physically die, you won't have to die. Of course, Jesus says it better over in John chapter 11, when he says he's the life, the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. But because they're still kind of talking and operating on a, with their natural brains and their natural, and Jesus is usually talking to them about supernatural things, naturally they're going to say, you know, who do you, who do you think you are? You think you're better than Abraham? And Jesus answered and said, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should if I should say I don't know him, I'd be a liar just like you. But I do know him and I keep his sayings. <laughs> Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Now, first of all, this statement right here, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. What does that mean? And how could that be? Because this is the natural question that they ask in verse 40, 57. The Jews said unto him, you're not even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus here is, this is probably one of the greatest responses and in, in most mind-blowing responses to me that he ever said, although there are quite a few. But Jesus is saying, I don't exist on the timeline like you think. I am beyond space and time. I, this is what I tell Jehovah's Witnesses when they have a problem with receiving Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. Jesus said, there are three things. These are the three things. Number one, Jesus receives worship, which he said, is only reserved for God alone. He receives worship. Number two, he forgives sin, which everybody knows and the Jews know. It is blasphemy to say that you can forgive sin because who can forgive sin but God alone? And the third one is right here. Jesus proclaims that he has no beginning or end. He proclaims that he's eternal. He proclaims that before Abraham was, I am. He is saying right here to these Jews, I'm the same guy that was talking to Moses at the burning bush. And when Moses asked me, who should I say sent me? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God responded to him and said, I am that I am. Tell him I am sent you. I, I, I was, I will be, but I always am. I currently am. It, it's, this is a hard one for the mind to receive sometimes, but... God is outside of time. You see, the God that we just prayed to is the same God that we look at and say, wow, this was, you know, 6,000 years, 4,000 years ago, he was talking to uh, David and however many years ago. But see, with God, he's beyond space and time. With God, on his watch, it was like six seconds ago. With us, it was it was prehistoric and, and primitive and but we've got to remember that it's the same God. He is the living God, and he is the great I am who exists all the time. He's eternal. The same God that was conversing with M Moses and Abraham to us thousands of years ago, to him it's not the case. And we need to approach him as he is the eternal God, the living God, and he is always on the case. And he's not some ancient God that you have to get 
him to remember and dust off his memory and try to remember. No, he, he honors his word. They said, you're not even 50 years old. What are you talking about? You've seen Abraham. And he says, before Abraham was, before Abraham was even conceived, I am because I am God. I am beyond man's space time continuum. I am beyond man's little timeline, periodic timeline there. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. They took up stones to, ca- to kill him because he had committed blasphemy. He said he was God, and they know that. They did the same thing in John chapter 10, which we'll get to. They wanted to kill him because he was saying things that no man ever talked, no man ever said. And they had a huge problem with it. And, you know, the simple truth is, what are we going to do with these claims that Jesus is making? If really, if we say that God is our Father, do we love Him? Are we willing to make Jesus and accept and receive Jesus as I am, as the I am, and and believe He is who He says He is because everything is riding on it? That's John chapter 8. 